You may be seated. And I know that sometimes you can get so propped up with faith and promise that you're so promised pregnant, you're like, I just want something to start happening. Can I get a witness? I mean, have you ever gotten to the place that's like, I don't want another promise. I just want all the ones that have been told to happen. I think that's kind of where you're at right now. So I'm going to give you some testimonies in relation to, that's why I told you what I just told you. The next day I wake up and I said, Lord, I know you loosed angels. There's no question about it. We had a great manifestation there. I said, you know what I'm going to ask you to do? I, I never asked the Lord to, to let my daughter win. That, that's kind of infantile. You know, that's, I mean, it's Bible quizzing. Come on. Be ridiculous. It's being like asking the Lord to let Cleveland win, you know. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know why you do that, but anyway, either one, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me, but the, the whole point is I, I wanted God to make sure she was covered, that she, when she quizzed, that the com competition and all the, the attitudes that could happen don't get to her. That was my prayer, that she would be covered so that she could quiz like it's a ministry, not a game. That, that's always what we've pushed in her life. So I said, Lord, I'm asking you to send an angel to protect her. So when she quizzes, her clarity is because she's quizzing for you because she's worshiping you with the word. I called her yesterday afternoon because um, it was over. And I, I called her. I said, Charity, I said, you know, I prayed for you. Uh, this morning, I asked the Lord, and I told her what I just told you. She said, Dad, you asked God to send an angel? I said, yeah. She said, Dad. She said, Dad, I, I, we were about to go to the quiz boards, and before we did, I thought, I've got to go pray because I have to be covered. And so she said, I separated myself from the group, and I went and found a little room somewhere in the church, and I closed the door, and I went to prayer, and she said, all of a sudden, I felt tinglies all over. She said, I, I said, whoa, this room has just been filled with angels. So I'm telling you these things so you'll start believing them for your current atmosphere. Not just, I know there's angels around. No, 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 no. That they have been sent for this particular timeline and this particular juncture to help accomplish what you have already been vocalizing in the atmosphere. In other words, God has heard your prayer. God has sent a response. God just wants alignment so what you ass and what he's determined and what we do are in tandem. Am I making sense to you? Is this all right? So I, I asked the Lord on Saturday because I didn't have a service Saturday so I spent a little bit of time inquiring of the Lord and the Lord talked to me about the dimension of your words from a cross perspective. The dimension of your words from a cross perspective. Let me, let me tell you that when things shift in the atmosphere like this, what we say, everybody say what we say. Hey, Brad Ford, good to have you. What we say matters more. What we say matters more. Okay, what you say matters more. Teenagers, you cannot step into an atmosphere like this. And then just blow it off and say, man, that was good. And then change your conversation. See, once you're aligned, you're aligned. You're not aligned for two hours on Sunday. You're not aligned for two hours midweek. You're not aligned for four hours in a session. No. Once you're aligned, you're aligned. So does everything matter or not? Everything, everything all of a sudden becomes magnified. I think I've told you this story before. I, I preached it today. They, they've heard it, but it was when my mom saw or heard a crash in front of their house. Two cars got mangled beyond description, and she ran out, and there was a man stuck in a car, and then the other guy was drunk. He was a drunk driver running around, and the guy was in there for his life. I mean, he was losing his life, and he was a, he was a policeman off duty, and so she, my mom went over there. 
dropped on her knees, started praying, talking in tongues and crying and asking God to save him, don't let him die. So she prayed for 45 minutes till the emergency flight line and all that life flight rather. And uh, the EMTs came and they did all the stuff. She just kept praying, 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 talking in tongues and asking the Lord. So they got done. They life flighted him out. She got up. She went to the house. She stopped praying. Okay, two weeks later, the guy shows up at their door, says, I'm the cop that you were praying for. Can I tell you the rest of the story? Two weeks, he walked out of that hospital, literally with nothing wrong with him. It was a miracle. And he said, actually, what happened? He said, I got in the helicopter and he said, I died. My spirit left my body. And he said, I was hovering in the air and I heard a voice and it said, don't let this person die. And then it would speak different languages. I couldn't understand what they were saying when she was talking in tongues. He said, God, I don't know who that is, but answer their prayer. I, I, I need my family. I need to go back to my family. God he said, all of a sudden, he said, I felt my spirit come back into my body. I, and I stopped my mom. I said, wait, mom, didn't you say that you stopped praying after the helicopter took off? She said, yeah. I said, you didn't pray anymore. She said, no. I said, the guy was in the air already when he said he heard your voice. She said, yeah. I said, you weren't praying then. She said, no. I said, that means he heard your voice after you stopped praying. It was still in the atmosphere. Pastor. Pastor. When I got a hold of that, I thought, oh, my God, she was in alignment because of the spirit. So what she said mattered. Why? Because it existed in the atmosphere to the point that it resurrected somebody from the dead. I thought, my God, how powerful do our words become now and how important does this particular timeline become? That's why it's imperative that Christians manage their speech. Why? Because your words take on volumes and the deeper you go in God, the bigger the volume gets. You catch that? The bigger, the bigger, the deeper you go in God, the bigger the volume gets. I remember an old prophecy uh, that was given to J.T. Pugh, and the reason I remember it is because the Lord had me given, scared me to death. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that, was our, that was one of our great elders. And I'm thinking, okay, let me get this right, Lord. You want me to tell him that? <laughs> you know what the Lord said? Nothing. <laughs> In other words, I already told you. I'm not going to tell you twice. <laughs> So I just kind of sheepishly went over to him. I, and he was such a kind gentleman. What a great man of God. Uh, and I said, Brother Pew. He said, yes, brother. I said, uh, I really feel like I have a word from the Lord. He said, absolutely. I, I want to hear this. So I got a little bolder. And the Lord started talking to him about stuff that intrigued me to want to follow after. He said, I am, and I don't remember exactly because I don't have it here written. I wasn't planning on talking about that. But the essence of it was one word has turned into a thousand. And when you speak one thing, it affects a thousand things. And now where you are going in your life, the, in other words, the depth of his relationship magnified the volume of the words. I'm starting to understand a little more now, but this is, this is 15 years ago. He said, Brother Hernandez, he said, that, that's the Lord. That's, he said, come here. He said, share this with my wife. <laughs> I thought that was cute. <laughs> I thought, okay, he feels like she needs this more than he does. <laughs> you ever felt that way? Don't say it. Don't, don't say it. Praise the Lord. Save your marriage. Don't say it. <laughs> Just look straight. Don't even look sideways right now. <laughs> Listen to the, I thought, what an intriguing concept that everybody think now as you're growing in God. How many of you have been in 20 years or more? You've been in the church 20. Okay. You are in a responsible dimension right now where your words are going to start magnifying. And it's imperative that you really pay attention to what you say because of what it's going to shift. One way or the other. One way or the other. It's going to shift something, and so it becomes imperative. I looked up this phrase. It was quite an interesting search. The Bible uses the words 
the words of, and then it references whoever was doing the speaking. The words of is used throughout the Bible, and ironically, when it's used most, it was heeded least. You know who it was used most by? Jeremiah. You know who was heeded the least? Jeremiah. I thought, isn't that amazing? It wasn't the volume of how much you speak. It was the volume of how much relationship you have. So the relationship determines the capacity of the words. Man, I feel a witness of the Holy Ghost so strong right now that if your words aren't having an effect on the earth, work on your relationship. There's some flesh in the way that's causing your relationship to not have the volume necessary to speak dominion upon the earth. And God created the church for it to have dominion one more time like Adam had dominion before he sinned. Amen. And the creation of the church being the second Adam Adam literally is the result of God restoring the earth back to its original position. That's what the church is supposed to be today. So God is repositioning the church for the purpose of last day dominion. God is repositioning the church for this last day dominion. It's amazing to me what's happening in the United Nations. And would you lift your hands right now and pray for Art Wilson and pray for, I'll just call her Sister Alexi. Pray for Sister Alexi right now. There is a major thing taking place literally right before us. And God is intervening and God needs to really help them so what is about to transpire when this all goes through, it's going to unloose the ability to send some of our men of God into places they couldn't even get into before at a diplomatic level. Lord, by the atakalebo roko shata namarahaya. Roko tokoriki alaba satalai. Roko, I pray somebody's word, God, in alignment. Touches the heaven and let it touch the earth and let it touch New York and let it touch the United Nations. And let it touch the hearts of men that don't even serve you. Jesus. Jesus. Lord, let somebody's word become like a thousand. Let a voice become magnified in the heavens. Let a voice shake foundations. Let it reach a dominion designed to be reached as you have designed the church to be. God Almighty, God Almighty, is this all right, Pastor? The, the, the way I operate is that God will give me a picture or, or like a moving screen or a word, and I'll have to go look it up to find out what he's talking about. That's how I landed this message. God gave me... A word, and I don't even—I don't even ever remember preaching this message. I mean, I know it was there. I'm not trying to say it appeared out of nowhere. That's not what I'm suggesting. It could have, but this one didn't. Just because I know the way I write, and it's the way I write. I just don't remember it. But God just pulled it, and He said this. I said, "Okay." And so let me talk to you about this dominion dimension, what God ordained Adam to have, and Satan saw it, and ever since he's tried to take it. Ever since. So it's like every move he makes is to try to demoralize or shift our speech so we don't stay in alignment. It's called distractions. Can I get a witness? distractions, he, he realized fear doesn't work because after we got attacked with 9-11, this country hit their knees for at least three months. Thank God, at least we got three months out of the deal. 
I mean, we didn't get much more than that. Then they went back to their bad habits. But what it did send a message to the enemy was we're actually still, amen, God conscious, at least, that an atrocity could cause people to hit their knees and call out to God, Jesus specifically. So it's we still have that somewhere in bread, amen, and some people that have enough sense to know when stuff goes real bad, they will call out to God. So, and see, that's the thing that Nebuchadnezzar took from Israel. He took out their voice. They didn't call out to God on their way to Babylon because he knew if they did that God would rescue. God would show up. God would come down, and he would respond to them. So he said, don't let them talk. Whatever you do, keep them looking at those dead bodies because if they ever lift their voice and they ever look up to their Jehovah, he will deliver them. Nebuchadnezzar knew that much. And so I feel like at 9-11... Hell tested America to see if we had a voice left. And some Christians rose up about that time. And we began to cry out unto God like never before. And God literally salvaged. Salvaged this country. Because it still had a voice. So the devil knows that he couldn't stop us with fear. So his next ploy, after several years of attempting the whole fear thing and realizing these people keep getting up, he said, okay, fear thing's not working. Let's go to distractions. He said, we got digital devices to work with now. Let's distract them. Let's use social media. Let's take their time, because if we can take their time, we'll take their alignment. Why? Because the only way to get aligned is to take time in prayer. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Right. You know it's true. I mean, how is it that somebody can sit down and watch a two-hour ball game and can't pray for two hours? I'm not rebuking you. I'm just asking a simple, honest question. How, how is it that you can take somebody shopping, they'll spend two hours, and they can't sit in the presence of God for two hours? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's distractions. The mind, what he does is the devil works in cycles because he doesn't have anything creative. Because everything new is above the sun, not under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything new is above the sun. Well, that's why it calls above the sun. It calls it a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Those are not underneath the sun. Those are above the sun. Why? Because the new stuff isn't in this atmosphere. It's in a celestial atmosphere. That's why when we get into the spirit of God, we've tapped into the new celestial atmosphere, and that's why we can obtain stuff that's not cyclic but creative. Am I making sense still? And God wants us to stay in the creative because that's where dominion operates. Dominion operates, Bishop, in the creative. That's why God could say, let there be light. That's why Adam could say, that's a bear, that's a lion. He didn't have to think. Uh, What do I call that? No, he didn't have to do that. Why? He was aligned. He was connected to the mind of God. So when he opened his mouth, God's speech came out. So he could look immediately. He knew what to name, what he looked at. Why? Because he was operating in that full alignment and dominion of God. And when you're operating that way, it's almost like a prophetical utterance. You look at something, you know what to say. You look at some situation, you know what to do. That's what we define as the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, amen, gifts of prophecy, gifts of healing. That's what we call the gifts of the spirit. Why? Because when you're in alignment and dominion starts working, you know, look on us. Silver and gold have I none. Such as I have, give I thee. What is that? Alignment and dominion. It's speaking. The word is it's flowing out of a throne through a vessel into a body. Mm. Praise the Lord. Whew. God said, 126 Genesis, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So here's my prayer request. What do you like today? 
And what would you like today? What is your likeness going to display on the earth and how? Where do I get to be a part of that? Where do I stand? What do I do? Think about how people pray. Go to the prayer room sometime and listen. Just listen. Don't go to pray. Just go to listen. And you'll hear things like, oh, God, heal this, save this, do this, change that, bring blessing here, give a job here, help this situation. Everything is earthbound. Most of the stuff that you're hearing in the prayer rooms is all earthbound. Why? They're not even reaching the will of the Father. It's still the will of the flesh. So, and I'm not saying it's wrong to ask for things personally. I'm just saying we're using that as our preliminary instead of our post. We're supposed to be asking for that stuff at the end, not at the beginning. But think about how we pray. We pray for most of the stuff at the beginning. You have to say anything. I know it's true. Because <laughs> I'm listening in prayer room meetings all across America. And I go to the prayer room for the sole purpose many times, not all the time, but many times. I go just to listen. I want to see where, where the people are at. That doesn't give me what to preach. I already know what, I pre what I'm going to preach when I walk in there. I don't do it for that reason. But I, I'm trying to learn where are we at so we can graduate to where we need to go. Where do we need to go here? Why, how did we get so earth-based distractions? Distractions have the ability to turn how we approach God, thus leveling the playing field because we're no longer perceiving things from a cross perspective or a throne perspective. We're now perceiving them from an issue perspective because the devil knows how to shift stuff and stir people up, people around our world, in our work world, in our common world, in our neighborhood, the guy that crossed the line and put the shovel in your yard and he ticked you off. Like, hey, that, that's my part of the, the yard. Who cares? Give the guy the dirt. I mean, come on, seriously? And that, that's what you talk about to your friends? You wasted how much time because your neighbor frustrated you a little bit? Don't get too quiet on me. I'll know where you're living. <laughs> I thought, oh my. And, and think about it. Hell's kingdom has been studying humankind for 6,000 years. If anybody knows how to read body language, it's not Harvard University. Though they may, they may house Satan. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't have any money, so you can't sue me. So, <laughs> let us make man in our image after our likeness. Why? Because if we make man in our image after our likeness then we can let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And there's some creepy people right now on the earth. <laughs> Hello? You know, what, here's an interesting thought, okay? I'll, I'll just throw it at you. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon now, isn't it interesting, when we got the Holy Ghost, we got it in our soul. Talk to me. You didn't get it in your flesh. You got it in your soul. It's still trying to help our flesh. And I thought, wow, what an interesting read. I understand the context and how he says it, what he's saying. But here's also what I understand, that when you get to the end of time, he makes this drastic impression that I'm going to move things into place to make sure my will is done at the end of time, because at the end of time, I'm going to make sure my scriptures and my prophecies are all fulfilled. And if I have to move flesh wherever I need to move it, I'm going to position it so my will can be done. So I am going to literally take puppets, if you will. I'm going to take people like puppets, and my spirit will come upon all flesh. 
And man, it got me to think, and I thought, why? Because when you get to the end of times, things escalate in speed. They start happening. Am I, am I making sense here? They start escalating in, in speed. In other words, the time becomes short. The Bible talks about the days being shortened. Well, what does that mean? That there's less than 24 hours? No, that everything seems to be going faster at a faster rate, which also, amen, whatever happens on the earth, understand, it's a reflection of the spirit world. If things seem to be going faster in the natural world, it's like, I can't believe 10 years just passed. How can you imagine? My daughter's 16. 16. Last time she was around you, she was 10. Where's the time gone? Okay, we say that all the time, but it's like on a world event scales, that's starting to happen now, and things are escalating. Well, if you think that's crazy in the natural world, I want you to multiply that in the spirit world and think how fast God is beginning to move things because everything's wrapping up, and in the last days, say of God, I will pour out of my spirit upon our flesh, so it becomes our task to align ourselves. So then that means the requirement is that we now have to align ourselves at a faster rate. Does that make sense? If everything else is happening at a faster rate, you can't go at the same speed. You can't. That's an atrocity waiting to happen. Well, I, you know, I pray my 15 minutes a day. Well, you better quit. Don't quit praying. But don't, you quit your 15 minutes, make it 45. Well, I ain't got time. Make time. Right. You know, everything else around you is speeding up. Right. You don't have time not to make time. Well, I just I have to go to work. Get up earlier. Yes, sir. Get up earlier. Yeah. You have to make a decision and say, I am going to speed up and align myself with the time frame here. Listen, I've had some early mornings because I made a commitment to God, and I have kept that commitment all year long. And I said, God, and I, I said, honey, she said, well, maybe, maybe you could, you'll be able to sleep in. I said, I can't. I said, I got to catch that plane at whatever time it was. So that means I have to get up at 3 o'clock. It's like, ooh, okay, I better let you go. <laughs> Well, because I have to. No, my body, Mexican body, does not like it. It's siesta made. It's, this body was made to do siestas. I'm a Latin, for God's sakes. I, was, I wasn't designed to get up at that hour, man. Not even the pickers get up at that hour. But I'm like, okay, Mexican, you're going to have to sit down because the Dominion man's getting up. I said, the Dominion person's getting up. You're going to have to do something about that and step up into that slap and say, here I am. Send me. Well, you just don't understand, Brother Hernandez. No, I don't understand. Get up. I don't understand that you can't understand that we are at the end of time. I don't understand that. Because you said you've been in the church 20 years plus, some of you, and you're still not doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. I'm asking you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the souls, for the sake of our timeline, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus Christ, do this. Align yourself to this. Get yourself an accountability partner. Say, look, call me every now and then. Check on me. Say, how you doing? Don't make excuses at this hour. Don't make excuses at this hour, please. Wow. I feel a real compassion of the Lord trying to help somebody right now. Would you just lift your voice and pray and ask the Lord to send help to the mind so the mind can attach itself to a decision and the decision can be, yea, Lord, yea, Lord, I, I will commit to what you're impressing on my heart. I will commit to what you're impressing on my mind. God, I will work on this thing and I will make some adjustments because there are adjustments that can be made, Lord, and I will step in to cause my flesh not to be, have preeminence, but the spirit can have preeminence. 
And I, I, I read, I, I heard actually from a book that was written uh, the other day. A guy was was in a country, and and uh, he was dealing with a, a group of people that pus was coming out of their skin, and they were diseased. And the people that were trying to help them were in in uh, uh, particular types of garments to to protect themselves. And this guy came in there full of faith, and. They said, you got to put one of these garments on. He said, no. He said, I'm, I'm so full of the spirit, that pus can't get in me. They said, okay. So he grabbed pus in his hand, in his hand, put it under the microscope, and the pus started to die. He said, the, the Holy Ghost is so in me. I'm so full of the Holy Ghost, there's no room for it to get in. It reminds me of what Brother T.W. Barnes said. Brother T.W. Barnes said before he died, he said, at this point in my life, I am more spirit than I am flesh. I thought, okay, so when you get to that point, Bishop Hansen, and we become more spirit than we are flesh, there are things that cannot creep into our dimension even of the flesh. Oh, my Father in heaven, what would happen if we would align ourselves so much that the Spirit would consume us and that we would look at a disease and it dried up while we arrived? Why? Not because of us, but because there's less of us and a whole lot more of him. That's the scripture, John the Baptist. I must decrease and he must increase. Why? Because if the increase of his kind comes up, that means the increase of this kingdom has no end. According to Isaiah. I thought, wow. Where are we headed? That's why I'm telling you. Close your Pentecostal box. We are not headed into waters where we've been before. We are headed into some waters that we are going to have to be spirit. In the likeness of our creator. To have dominion what? Over everything, basically. Is that dominion established from a cross perspective given to the church to be exercised in the church, by the church, for the church, to establish the church? The place where hell is broken up and kingdoms crumble and walls of Jericho fall down at what? The obedience to what? First of all, God tests his how? Man of God. Man of God tells them, we're going to shout. We're going to break pictures. We are. Well, if you're, if you're accustomed to seeing things happen in the supernatural, it won't freak you out so much. So, they had already learned from past experiences that it wouldn't be good to rise up against the man of God, thus the earth open up and swallow you. You know, you get a visual when certain things happen when you've been raised around this a little while. <laughs> They're called trigger points. It's like when I, I hear certain things, it triggers my brain and I get this flashback. It's like, okay, I'm doing this. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, I just looked at four years of my life where I didn't. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no problem. What do you want? <laughs> it's almost like Israel with Joshua. It's like, mm, don't want to be swallowed. That's easy. When do we shout? <laughs> when do we break the pictures okay we're going to march around this thing the last day we're going to march around seven times and when I tell you wait till I tell you let me read it to you Joshua chapter 6 verse 10 and Joshua had commanded the people saying ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout then shall ye shout you know what's happening here there's a volume of dominion that's taking place because Joshua has stepped into position and now he's leading the people under that same kind of dominion that Moses had and the people recognize it when the people recognize it wow our whole church is walking in this dominion vein it's best if we don't try to bump this thing up and there's an obedience that comes over the congregation via the man of God because they understand something's about to happen here. We've seen too much for it not to happen. And whatever he says, that's what we're going to do because God is moving this thing forward. So don't get out of alignment. Why? It drags the rope. You ever had a tug of war before? The guy that's not aligned in his feet. 
What is he doing? He's dragging the team. Why? He's become dead weight. Why? He's lost his footing. Now he's just dead weight. He's not really helping the team. Everybody's screaming at him like, come on! Why? You need to get your feet about you. Why? We all need to be in tandem, pulling at the same time, with the same cadence, with the same roll, if you're in one of them little canoes, or big canoes. Ho! 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 It's all the same stroke. Why? Because the moment one guy gets out of alignment, he becomes a drag. You don't want to become a drag. Not at this juncture. It's pulling so fast, somebody might step on you. Hope it's not me. Because <laughs> I weigh a lot. I could hurt you. <laughs> he said, do not. Open your mouth. Don't say a word until the day I bid you shout. Then shall you shout. Six verses later, and it came to pass at the seventh time, several days later, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! One word released thousands of Israelites. One word multiplied into a shout, and the walls went, got swallowed up in the ground. I thought, wow. So Joshua went from simple obedience under Moses' command to a volume of speech with one word. Miracles don't just bless others. They test our obedience and submission. I was in Vancouver, British Columbia. We were in a song service. Might seem odd. Say, eh, I don't know if God would do that. Well, ask the girl. Mm -hmm. She's in the middle of song service, and in the middle of song service, she stops praising. She looks up. She goes and walks out of the church. Everybody thinks, what happened to her? She goes into the bathroom. She tells me the story later. She said, God told me to stop because he was going to heal me. I'm like, okay. She said, I've had a corporal tunnel for a long time, and God says, Stop. Go dip your elbow in the sink. Oh, that's ridiculous. Is it? So she stops, simple obedience, looks up, says, okay. She said, I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't asking God about it. I was just obeying. So she said, I didn't question it. And I thought, that's strange, but okay, here I go. So I went in the bathroom. There was no plug for the sink, so I got some toilet paper, plugged it up, filled it up, stuck my elbow, said, in Jesus' name, and she said, I felt tingly shoot through my arm. I went, whoa. And she said, I unplugged it, let it drain, came out, started worshiping God, no pain. She said, I have no carpal tunnel. It is gone. What? What, what if this new convert, simple obedience can come back to us as childlike faith? Well, I'm not sure if that was gone or not. Well, you're not the one with no doctor bill. She's the one with no doctor bill. <laughs> what about when it's our turn? How easy is it for us? It gets harder the older you get. Because you think you know. And then God sends you a curveball just to, he's not testing whether he can heal you or not. He's testing us to see if we're willing to obey at what levels. And if it's not God, if you're willing to repent. Well, I thought that was the Lord, so I did it, but it wasn't. So I asked God to forgive me, help me to hear better. What's wrong with that? God won't kill you if you make a mistake. There's a big difference between a mistaken prophet and a false prophet. What's the difference? Motive. Right? The guy that knew he was going to do wrong, his name's Saul. <laughs> That's a big difference. I've made mistakes. God didn't kill me. I'm still here. Why? Because when I made the mistake, I asked God to forgive me or the person. 
I mean, I had a whole con- Let me tell you a good story. It's good for everybody else. It's good for me eventually. <laughs> but it was tough to take. I mean, I'm a human being too. I've got feelings too. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. You need to learn how to put your feelings at the altar. Bury your feelings at the altar. Let God help you with that. Don't carry them on your shoulders. Amen. Otherwise, they become king. You know, whatever you carry on your shoulder is a king. (laughs) That's how they used to carry a king. Right? And they carried a king on their shoulders. So whatever you carry on your shoulders, that's king. That's why he said, my burden is light. If you're going to carry one, carry mine. Why? Then you're carrying the king of kings. Don't carry all the other ones. Those are just burden you down. And they'll build a different character about you. Wow. God's talking to us right now. I said, God's talking to us right now. But you're waiting to hear the story. Because <laughs> everybody likes a good story. So I am at... What is now Brother Jack Cunningham's church in Virginia. Wonderful church. Runs 700 and something people. And so I'm preaching a district meeting. Brother Hall is the superintendent at the time. This is years ago. The place is packed. It's a She's for Christ rally. And there's probably 750, 800 people there. District superintendent, all the presbyters, all the youth directors, and the youth president, who's obviously tilting me around from place to place. And... So we're in this meeting. I mean, it's blowing and going. We've had church. And I've got the mic. I'm preaching. I'm in the middle of preaching. I'm over here on this side of the building. And I I stop and I look at a man. And I am sure the Lord just spoke to me. And I look down at him. And I said, sir, I said, the Lord tells me, blah, 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 blah. He looks up at me. He says, I don't have that problem. I thought, hmm, okay. So everybody's staring at me. Times a whole lot more people than you. (laughs) So I looked down at him. I said, I'm going to ask you again. I didn't take the microphone away. I kept it there. I wasn't trying to hide because it, it either is or it is not. And if it is not, we need to be big enough to repent. Wow, I couldn't do that. Well, then that means you have pride. You need to work on that and get rid of that because you can't get aligned with God with pride. Flesh will always get in the way if you have pride. And remember, pride doesn't always have a voice. Arrogance always has a voice. So I'm standing there and I said, okay. I said, wait, let me ask you again. I said, because I really felt like the Lord impressed me this, that you have this, this, and I said the same thing. He said, Brother Hernandez, I'm sorry, but I don't have that problem. I said, I'm going to ask you one more time, sir. I said, because if not, I need to do something. And I asked him one more time. He said, I apologize, but I really don't have that problem. I said, fine. Then everybody, I want you to look at me. I said, because I have made a mistake. I said, I've made an honest mistake. And I'm asking this congregation, all those 750 people, superintendent, everybody was there and God included. And I said, I'm asking you to forgive me because if I can't get your forgiveness, I cannot minister to you. It's the only thing to do. That's what Billy Cole taught me to do. He said, you repent. You ask for, an, you apologize and ask them to release you. Man, when I said that, those people started clapping their hands. They said, preach, preach. They released me in the Holy Ghost. We had a divine move of God that night. And the Holy Ghost did some marvelous things. Because it was the only thing to do. Here's the marvel of that story. Eleven years later. I come back to that church. It's Brother Cunningham's church now. I'm doing a leadership training meeting. MIT's ministers in training. I told that story, Brother Hanson. After the meeting was over, a lady comes up to me. She's all excited. Sister Hanson, she looked at me. She said, Brother Hernandez. She said, I remember that service. I was a new convert. She said, and I remember that was the most powerful service I'd ever been in in my life. She said, but you know what's crazy? She said, I never left the service, but I don't remember that part of it. God literally blinded her because I was willing to submit myself and humble myself. What if I had not done that? You know what happened? By staying aligned, even while I made a mistake and humbled myself before God, the alignment allowed it. You don't think God can blind eyes? What about the two guys on the way to Emmaus who were walking with Jesus after the resurrection and they couldn't even tell it was him? 
And while they're breaking bread, he disappears and they say, wow, didn't our hearts burn within us? Thank you. <laughs> what, that doesn't make me anything special. It just is supposed to be the habits we exercise as the humble body of Christ. That way, distractions don't take our and waste our time. I hope that helps somebody. Once you've given up your path to others, Jesus can do a lot of miracles. The miracles performed were not for Jesus' benefit. Those 37 documented miracles in the New Testament, they were for others. And they were to display his glory for the purpose of him receiving glory. But think about this, Judas Iscariot. When Judas started his journey's downfall, it magnified when he did what? When he questioned the miracle and couldn't submit to the process of the miracle of that moment. What am I referring to? John chapter 12. Jesus, six days before the Passover, comes to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So they're visiting there at Lazarus' house, and Martha's there, and Mary's there, and there made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? So how'd you enjoy your resurrection? <laughs> what a cool conversation that must have been. Can you imagine talking about being resurrected? My dad had a an experience not quite that drastic because he only died for 10 minutes and went to heaven and literally saw it and then came back and lived another, I think, 15 years. I can't remember the exact time since then. And he, we just buried him January this year, and he's 86 years old. Amen. But was able to live an additional 10, 15 years after that death and resurrection. So I cannot imagine after four days what kind of stuff you talk about. We don't know what that's like because we send them straight out to get sucked out all their stuff out of their body and get them embalmed and we don't even know. We don't give time, very much time for resurrections in this country. We don't. You look at me like, well, no, we call 911. <laughs> well, let's try it. I mean, what's it going to hurt? Give it an hour or two or three. I mean, <laughs> have you ever seen somebody resurrected, ma'am? Have you ever seen, no, that lady right there. Have you ever seen somebody resurrected? It's one of the most phenomenal things to watch the look on their face when they come back from the dead. It's, and I'm telling you, I'm not talking about stories overseas. I'm talking about I saw resurrection in America. I've actually never seen resurrection overseas. I've only seen it in America. I remember one time, that's why I'm kind of hesitant to give titles of messages, because I was giving a title in Michigan before you get to the other side, and as I'm saying it, she's going to the other side. <laughs> she falls over dead. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. Did she pass out? And the, and brother brother um, <laughs> Lehman uh, is sitting over here, Paul Lehman in Saginaw, Michigan, and and his daughter-in-law, brother Kevin Lehman's wife, Sandy, is on the organ. And I looked at her. She goes, "She's gone. She's a nurse." She said, "I've seen death too many times." She said, "I I could tell. I see it on her face. She was gone." And then her sister was on the other side, and she said. She's gone. They ran over, no pulse, nothing. She was gone. So everybody's kind of panicking and they're kind of just staring. I said, well, folks, I probably shouldn't preach right now, so let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> I mean, who's going to listen to me and preach? <laughs> She's dead, you know. So somebody went out in the back and they're going to call, you know. I said, okay, they've just called emergency. That means we got about 10 or 15 minutes before they come and take her away. We got a 15 minute window here folks you want to stare or you want to pray it's kind of like that fishing guy right 
stick of dynamite in the water. And he says, I'm the warden. I knew you were doing something wrong. And the guy gives him a stick of dynamite and says, you're going to talk or you're going to fish? <laughs> Same thing. Look, we got a dead woman in our congregation. You're going to stare or you're going to pray? So they said, man, let's pray. So everybody blew up in prayer. We started praying 15 minutes here. They're, they're walking through the door, and she sits up talking in tongues. I didn't even need to preach after that. Eight people came to the altar and got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know what? What is that? That's when God causes shock treatment in the congregation to get the body to align itself to what the spirit already had on its mind and wanted to do. You know, those are great stories, but who wants to die tonight? Exactly. So let's not depend on shock treatment to keep us aligned. All right? So he's at Lazarus' house. They're talking. Mary takes this pound of ointment from Spike Nard and very costly and begins to anoint the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house is filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, out of alignment, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? You know, I don't know. I'll have to go back and check, but off the cuff, I don't think that Satan had entered his heart yet. I don't think so. So what did this do? This misalignment with the speech sent a signal to the spirit world. And the devil looked and said, hey, we got one. We got one with an attitude. We got a chance to slip in and use him against his own. You know, that's how church splits start. Somebody says, oh, why do we even do that? And the enemy goes, you hear that? We got a chance. Let's slip in and get him to go against his own. Why? Because those that slip with their tongue usually are used with that same tongue. Why? Because the enemy found an open door. That's why speech becomes so important when you're moving in alignment in the spirit and somebody gets out of kilter and you get offended or you get an attitude or you, like, why did they even waste that money on that sound system? You know what you did? You opened the door allowing the enemy to possibly use you. Speech. You think it's not important. Let me tell you this story that actually happened on the East Coast. Um, she was from Maine. Her name's Shauna. Um, Shauna Moss is her name now. She's a pastor's wife. It's actually Billy Cole's um, by marriage niece. So his nephew, or grandson, excuse me, granddaughter. So his grandson and granddaughter pastor the West Virginian, Charleston, West Virginian church. So sister, sister Moss now, when she was a kid, Shauna, 12 years old, got filled with the Holy Ghost, Maine. And her parents weren't in church yet. She was sitting in her room. Her mom was at home. Her mom said, baby, I need to get some milk. I'm going to go to the neighbors, so just I'll be right back. Okay, Ma. Walked out the door. Door closed. Door open. She said, Mom, did you forget something? No voice. Heard footsteps. I said, Mom. She walked by. Looked up. There was a man dressed in a black suit with a tall hat. And looked over at her. She said, I knew it was not good. So under my breath, I was only 12. She said, I started saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He stared at me, turned back around, went and stood in my parents' room. 
stood at the edge of their bed on the corner. And I was just looking, and Jesus kind of looking down and looking over. Jesus, Jesus. And then all of a sudden, the door opened. I said, Mom! And I kind of looked that direction, you know, because I knew she was on that side. And then I looked back to see if he was still there. Disappeared. Demon. Just to give you a clear picture. So the mom comes in. She said, you okay, baby? She said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay, Ma. And she said, all right. So about five minutes, the husband comes home, walks down the hall, walks exactly to that same spot where that demon disappeared and proceeds to engage in an argument with his wife like the daughter had never seen in their lives before. And you don't think speech matters? It matters. It matters that we align ourselves, that what we declare in here, we live out there. Not just about saying nice stuff. It's about the declarations you make inside the presence of the Lord. And so he opens the door to this speech. And I think that was the beginning of the end for him. Why? He questioned a miracle. He questioned even more so a memorial. Don't ever question God's memorials. They're sacred. Jacob's memorial was sacred. Abraham's memorial was sacred. The miracles that happened in the New Testament are memorials that are sacred. I just heard a conversation this week in this part of the country of a man and the reason for his downfall. I now understand it. Why? He questioned the miracle at Bethesda. He questioned whether the water actually stirred or not. The moment he questioned the miracle, he did exactly what Judas did. He questioned a memorial with God. Why? Those are memories, amen, that were ledgered in, in ink on parchment for the purpose of building the faith of those that would read it. And the moment you start questioning faith, what causes faith? What builds faith? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the... The moment you start questioning that process and those ledgers, amen, that were given through lives of people that lost their lives for the gospel's sake, you're opening a door you may not be able to shut. You don't want to go there. I think that's where Judas opened his. And because uh, the Bible says, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Because as we know, and I've heard pastors say it all over the country, the issue is never the issue when somebody comes with an issue. It's usually something else. They usually talk to you about what's not really the cause and effect. And you don't have to say anything, pastors. I understand. They're here. They're watching you <laughs> with both eyes. <laughs> then Jesus said, leave her alone. You leave her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor, you'll always have the poor. But me, you won't always have. Hmm. It appears the ultimate path of ministry is when all miracles that happen, happen to the glory of God and we don't have any emotions in the success of it. Because true success is doing the will of God, not working for God. Every miracle was the process of someone else being blessed and the moment miracles or the gifts of the spirit help our insecurities, dilemmas or struggles and make us feel better, we're not ready to go to the greatest dimensions. Miracle signs and wonders and manifestation of God in the last days can never be to help you. If you're trying to minister to somebody else, they cannot be used to secure you. You can't use them as, amen, coverings for insecurity. You got to get rid of that before you operate in those dimensions and allow God to deal with that on a separate plane. I know people, and I'm not going to go into details, but I know people that used it as affirmation because they didn't have a father and they didn't get affirmation in their life. And their ministries are destroyed. They're destroyed today, right now. And they were greatly used by God. And I thought, God, how did this happen? He said, because when I started moving, they took the credit. Trying to fill gaps in their personal lives. He said, when I do a miracle, he said, you give me glory and you leave the details alone. Uh, 
because you know when you when you can if we can somehow get to the place where we say God I'm going to let some flesh die out of my life because I got to get aligned with you and whatever that takes that's what I want to do because that alignment causes something to happen that cannot be deterred even when people agitate you Paul gets to this place where, where he, he doesn't, I mean, this, this girl follows him. It takes him three days. Some people will take three minutes. You'd be agitated in three minutes. Think about somebody that agitates you, and they do it, but they can't even get you to open your mouth for three days. Three days, she said. This is the man of God. This is the man that's preaching the way of salvation. He was irritated the first day she said it. But he didn't respond to it. He let her continue. Three days. <laughs> Imagine somebody agitating you for three days. Some of you ain't even looking at me right now. You, you, you don't even want to look up. <laughs> and look. Some of you are looking at me kind of mad right now. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just telling you what, what happened here. Three days later, he says, he didn't rebuke her. If you notice, he didn't address her flesh. He addressed the spirit that was agitating her flesh that was trying to agitate his flesh. Why? Maybe it took him three days to get over not addressing her flesh. I don't know. That's, that's up to Paul and Jesus. I don't know the details of that part. All I know is he kept his mouth shut, which the point is well made. If you can't deal above the flesh level, keep your mouth shut. Wait until you get a line because until you get at the spirit dimension, you're really not speaking in dominion. You're speaking in frustration. That makes sense to anybody besides me here. And so wait, wait, wait it out. Why? Because if you align yourself, God's going to give you a word, and that word's going to be a whole lot more powerful than the discussion you might be able to have with them to deal with them at flesh level. You'd be better off to deal with them at a prophetical level, at a dominion level, at a word of wisdom level, at a word of knowledge level, at a word of discerning of spirits level, because then you can deal with the spirit and break off the spirit that's upon that person and give that person a chance to be delivered wow this is great Jesus can I get the tape praise the Lord this ain't me listen to this the, the dimension of Acts 19 where the spirit world recognizes the who's who of the kingdom of God Paul, we know. Jesus, we know. Look at this amazing revelation to me, anyway. Uh, and, and Acts 19 and 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth, which teaches me a huge lesson about when a church gets aligned. It starts operating in apostolic dominions, and when the other churches start losing people because of that, they will try to copy us, and then God will expose them. This is where it separates, if you will, the men from the boys, as some would say. And, and But watch what happens here. And, and so they call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by whom, by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And listen to this. There were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priest, which did so. Preacher's kids that lost anointing. It's right there. Sons of Sceva, who was the chief of the priests. PKs. Who thought they could do this without the anointing. And they did so, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? They did not even recognize him based on their religious hierarchy. They didn't care whose son you were. 
What they paid attention to was who are you aligned with? And I thought, wait a minute. Here's the awesome part. I got to thinking about this story. The demon said, right? Correct me if I'm incorrect, but I, I'm not. I'm following the word here. The demon said they knew Paul. Amen? Wait a minute. He wasn't there. He had sent the handkerchief. <laughs> You're thinking, I know. He wasn't there. He had sent the handkerchief. And by the handkerchief, demons were being cast out and people were getting healed by the apron that was sent. I thought, well, wait a minute. I had to reread it again myself. I had to go back and look. I thought, oh my Lord. His word, that dominion state had magnified to the point he wasn't even using words. He had just a handkerchief. Somebody showed up with Paul's handkerchief and the devil recognized whose handkerchief it was. By the anointing that was associated with the man of God who sent it out. I thought, Get out of here. So the handkerchief shows up and the demon world says, Paul's here. Why, his spirit is attached to that apron he prayed over and that thing has enough power to cast this out and he's not even on location. I thought, what kind, what kind of dominion is that that literally you can align yourself so with Jesus Christ and get into such depths of prayer that you could send out a cloth in that kind of a dimension and hell would say, Jesus, amen, we know him. Paul, we know him. Neither of them are here in person. I thought, oh God. Okay, help me. Talk to me. What are the components here that I need to work on next in myself? To get out of the way so I can get in that positive alignment where the spirit of the Lord's soul begins to flow. That when I send out a handkerchief, the residue of that anointing is still upon it by the time it reaches. And it's not like us. It couldn't send a text message or a Facebook ad. It's not like us. They had to go by horse. They had to go by ship sometimes. And so that thing was days out of Paul's hands. Days, Bishop. But days later, the residue of the glory is still hanging on to where that ham handkerchief and that apron had been because it had been so saturated by the anointing of that man of God that by the time it reached its location, there was still residue somehow, amen, present in the atmosphere of that handkerchief. It wasn't the handkerchief. I'm smart enough to know that, amen, but because of the atmosphere that Paul by faith sent, it literally attached itself. Yeah, you ever been? You, you ever been to a hall after it was rented by a bunch of apostolics that had a move of God, and then after it was over, you went back to do some details, and the staff looks at you and says, "Wow, you guys, you guys had an amazing time." I walked in here today, and I could still feel things. Well, what, what is it? You know why that is? That's that handkerchief dimension. That's that residue of the glory. That's that residue of the presence. What happens if a whole body of church like this church aligns itself into that alignment of the spirit and dominion of God? And we begin to pray based on not what our needs are. What, what if prayer turned into submitting our will? Would alignment happen quicker and our requests be answered faster? Because we are no longer asking God based on our parameters. We're releasing our will and saying, whatever you do, I'll be okay with it. Faith isn't asking God for stuff that you want. Faith is believing God and releasing the stuff and whatever he does, we're okay with it. That's actually the raw description of faith that I came up with just out of my bare brain which wasn't much 
But I think it's really releasing God and saying, you know what? Go for it. And, and I'm good. Either way, I'm good. It, it, doesn't, I, it doesn't have to be the way I'm thinking of it. Matter of fact, it probably would be best if it's not that way because I got such a small mind here. Only 10% of it works. And I'm operating off 10% here, God. So I give you the tithe. I'll give you my will. That's the tithing of my being. They say up to 10% of your brain works. That's tithing. We say we give our tithes, do we? If we give all of our tithes, that means that 10%, at least 10% of our will has to be given up, and most of that's tied to our brain. Only 10% of that works, so mm, do the math. Hmm. Paul said, this is how I started my journey of alignment. I went to Mars Hill, and man, I showed him. I showed him that I graduated from Harvard. Gamaliel was my master and teacher, and man, I'm the best. I'm the Pharisee of the Pharisees, and I've got it together, man, and I wowed them with my speech. And they go, yep, your 20 minutes are up. Next, nice speech, Paul. We'll talk to you about this later. Let's see who else is on the schedule. And Paul's like, and only a few believed. Bible says only a few believed. And Paul's kind of blown backwards. He's like, hey, that was good. What's wrong with these people? I gave them my best shot. What's wrong with these dumb Grecians? It's what they get for being Greeks. I'm a Jew. <laughs> Why? Because people, when people don't receive our stuff at the best we got, we get a little taken back. <laughs> That's the human nature. It's like, hey, I put a lot of effort into that. Right? I mean, it'd be like somebody, you bake a pie for somebody, a nice sweet apple pie, and they just throw it on their face and say, That's good. It's like, hey, 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 you're dropping some. Stop it. Right? And you put a lot of effort in. I mean, Try it with me. I promise I won't put in my face. I'll, I'll eat the whole thing. <laughs> I'll be like Brother Cole. I ate the whole thing. Can you pray for me? That actually happened to him. <laughs> Somebody baked him an apple pie. And Brother Morton Buster was preaching for him. I'll just tell you this short story. And uh, Brother, he said, Brother Buster, we got to eat this pie. It's the best pie you ever eaten. <laughs> so you got to eat it. He said, Brother Cole, I'm stuffed. I can't. I got to go to bed. He went to bed 30 minutes later. Brother Bustard, Brother Bustard, yes, Brother Cole, he said, Brother Bustard, can you pray for me? I've eaten the whole thing. <laughs> he, he sat there and stared at that pie until he couldn't take it, and he just consumed the whole apple pie. You would appreciate him if you made the apple pie. But Paul gets out of Mars Hill. He comes back to Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know what happened? He aligned himself. You know what his passion was? His passion was trying to reach people in the synagogue because that's what that was his life in the past. But if you study his life, he didn't have much success in the synagogues. His greatest success was outside of the synagogues. I mean, he, he went to Malta, he went to that island way outside of a synagogue, and first they thought he was, you know, vexed, and then they thought he was a god, <laughs> and before you know it, he's practically, he prayed the chief through the Holy Ghost, and they had a great revival and had all these miracles, signs, and wonders, and he's got all this manifestation, and he still always tries to go back to, to that heady and high-minded bunch, and try, and he always just had little success with that group. And I think that finally at this juncture of his life, he's getting older and he's like, you know what? Alignment's the best thing. And he said, you know, when I align myself, my speech and my preaching, it left the parameter of what my flesh could do. It stepped into the parameter of what his spirit could do. And it appears to me that once you've given up your will and prayer, perhaps the best things start to be released at that juncture. So what if we take the next several months and now begin to say, you know what, God, forget it. I mean, here's a list of stuff I have, whatever. Look at it. You, you seen it? Okay, I'm going to put it in a box somewhere. And, and I'm just going to work every day on giving up my will. 
And now I'm going to give up my will on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the next question, the only question I really have is, God, what would you have me to do? What do you, I mean, I got to go to work. Yeah, you got to do the things that you do. You live a normal life. I understand that. But in the other times, God, what would you have me to do? Do you have an assignment for me today? Do you have something? Talk to me, God. Talk. And I, I guarantee you, I, I don't, I don't think. I guarantee you that if you start putting your list aside and dying out to your will and say, here's my will, God, just have it. I lay my will at the altar today and I, I've got whatever schedule because that's the things that have to happen. Obviously, men and women have to work. You got to pay bills. You got to live in houses and you have to raise families. Understood. God understands that. He's the one that allows us to have families. Amen. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the extra stuff where we say, God, what are you going to do? Give that aside. Give that up. Say, okay, God, you're going to do something about that. I'm good with that. Whatever you do, I'll rejoice with it. Praise God. But God, what do you want? I, I put my will aside. What do you, I want to please my king. I want to do something for my king today. I, it may not be witnessing to somebody. It may be praying for somebody. It may be calling somebody. It may be God quickening you to pray for somebody you don't even know. And he impresses you with the region of the world. And you go on your face and you pray for 30 minutes because something overcomes you. Because now you're not giving yourself to what your will wants. You're giving yourself to the will of the kingdom. And now the kingdom has somebody it can touch. I hope this is getting through. The Garden of Gethsemane prayer that changes you. It changes your disposition, your will. Not my will, but thine be done. To his will, then your speech starts aligning itself to his will, not to our prayer requests. And, and he gives him the example, the model. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc., etc. He gets the ultimate expression of it. And then he shows us what happens at that dimension. And I'm not talking about going to a cross. I mean, the Filipinos try that, and it's pretty havoc. It wreaks havoc in the spirit world. It's so dark. They literally have people that, that crawl, and they'll go to a cross and get crucified and die. And don't resurrect. It's, it's darkness at its, during Easter, it's darkness at its worst level ever. You, 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 it's just, that's absolute darkness. And religious darkness to the worst kind. And But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, dying out to your will. And Jesus gave us the physical example of what we could exercise as a daily example. So we could have the same kind of result. So here it is. I mean, you know the story of the cross. I mean, you wouldn't be sitting in this building. But Matthew twenty-seven fifty. He's he's at the cross. He's he's a bloody mess. He's dying. He's dying out. But here's the principle of dying out. Jesus, when he had cried, it's no longer his will, right? Because as a man, it's not his will. As a man, he's given up his will. He's he's death to that cross, and that cross is death to him. But as God manifested in flesh, the will of heaven is being pronounced here. And Jesus, when he had cried again with the lie voice yielded up the ghost and and he's made that statement it is finished it is finished three words three words what can three words do well let's check when you're fully aligned and your flesh is dead three words cause these kind of things to happen the Bible says the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. How can you humanly do that? You can't. But when you die out to your flesh and you're in alignment with the will of heaven, God can loose stuff that we can't do by the hands of men. And all of a sudden, a curtain starts ripping from top to bottom. The earth starts shaking. How many of us could shake the earth? I, mean, I don't care how fat you are. You can jump up and down all you want. You're going to shake a little spot, but you ain't going to shake the earth. But he said there's a dimension in the spirit where you can literally cause the earth to shake. Read it. It's found in Acts chapter 4. They prayed. They were in alignment. They started praying the word, and the place where they were gathered together was shaken. It literally shook 
So apparently what happened on the cross can happen with the church because they were the church in Acts chapter 4. Amen. So I thought, oh my God, this is wonderful. This is that place where they come off the Amen train station in Azusa, and they're a mile away from where they're having a prayer meeting. And as soon as they step off the, the train, Amen part, and they step onto the platform, they fall out talking in tongues, and they didn't have the Holy Ghost before. Why? The place where they prayed all of a sudden took up territory. Now, instead of just a block, it's taken up six blocks. Now, instead of six blocks, it's taken up 15 blocks. Now, instead of 15 blocks, it's taken up a quarter mile. Now, instead of a quarter mile, it's taken up a half mile. Now, instead of a half mile, this thing keeps going out like a rock hitting the water and spreading out. Amen. The little waves and it keeps going out. Now, its reach has reached beyond three quarters of a mile. Sister, it's touched an entire mile. Now, when the train stops and the people get out, they're falling out on the platform speaking in tongues for the first time in their life filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost they're not even worshiping they're not even praying So the ultimate dimension of dominion is when it shakes stuff and you don't even know what it's shaking and the people that are getting affected are just because they're coming close within reach stopping turning so i gotta go in that church right now i have to come i don't know what i feel it's like the man that was driving by in blue springs missouri and i was in the middle of a message red hot holy ghost message and god he walked in through the door like this sister just walked in through the door he sits in the back big burly bearded guy sits second pew to the last in the back god said change your message it's not in my notes God said, change your message. Start preaching that I am the God that delivers from suicide. Didn't even have anything to do with my notes, Bishop. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, here we go. You know, he's in charge. I mean, this is his kingdom. It's his will. I'm, I'm, I don't have to finish something. Well, it'll make you look bad. Good. It'll make him look good. I'm more than happy to look bad if he looks good. I'm good with that because he'll take care of me. Then it'll all look good at the end. Praise the Lord. So I changed the message. I started preaching. People kind of just, okay, and you know, they're cooperative. People are kind. And so I start talking about the God that delivers from suicide. I preached it five, seven minutes, ten at the most. I said, okay, let's stand. I said, God's going to move in here. God's wanting to do something special. I didn't have an idea or a clue why. I actually didn't put the two together at the time. So I said, let's come to the altar. He come fast right to the front right here at the wall. Wow, that's quite responsive. And uh, I said, sir, you want the Holy Ghost? He said, I, I need something. I, I got to have something happen. I said, okay. I said, folks, let's just start worshiping God. I said, I want you to repent. He said, how do I do that? I told him how to repent. And then I walked him through simple repentance, and he repented. And uh, I said, you need to lift your hands. God's going to fill you with his spirit. He lifted his hands. I don't know how many times he said hallelujah. It wasn't very many. And he started talking in tongues. He talked in tongues for about 15 seconds, and he broke down. I said, bro, you just got the Holy Ghost. He said, you have no idea what just happened. I said, yeah, you just got the Holy Ghost. He said, no, you don't have any idea what just happened. I said, yes, I do. You got the Holy Ghost. He said, no, no, I know what I'm talking about, man. I, I hear what you're saying. He said, you can explain it to me, but you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? He said, I was driving by this building, and a voice spoke to me, said, you need to turn around and give me one more chance. And he said, and I walked in this building knowing I have a loaded pistol in my glove compartment because I was about to blow my brains out. So I told God, I said, I'll give you one last chance. And I stepped in here and you started talking about the God that delivers from suicide. I thought, oh my God. Then I started crying. I thought, oh God. I said, let's worship God together, man. God, he's living for God today. That was 20 years ago. I found out he goes to an independent church in Missouri. He's married. He's got a family. He's got kids. Amen. They've raised an apostolic family in the church of the living God. He's still delivered today. Why? There's something about alignment.
tonight. Man, I feel witness of the Spirit. A whole bunch of angels just moved in here. Would you stand to your feet, throw your hands in the air right now, wherever you're standing in this building, and lift your voice in the atmosphere that you're at right now. Let something come out of your soul chamber that reflects what the Lord has spoken to you in this service. That's it. Let a reflection of a word fitly spoken, of a, of a prophetical utterance spoken, of a story that injected itself into your conscience and mind, and let the Spirit of the Lord now quicken a prayer to come out of your innermost being, that out of the depths of your soul and your belly, amen, a resolve, a reverberation of the Spirit of the Lord may come in contact with the words that you are sending up before the throne of God in the atmosphere of the Lord that is upon us in this hour. I want you to produce an exercise. Step out of your pew and gather yourself with someone that's not of your household, brother to brother and sister to sister, and make groups of three, four people. And I want you to pray that God would help your brother and help your sister because mentally they've already gone through a process of things they need to do. Is that true, everybody? Acknowledge if, if, if God's talked to you about some things. Acknowledge. Just say amen. Okay? So there are some things here, and God, if God hasn't talked to you, uh, listen a little better. He's talking, and uh, he's mentioned several things already in this atmosphere and things that have directly hit you and some things that you have assimilated by putting context together, scripture, word, and stories even that have affected some people in this building. So I want you to put a action into motion and think about a process that you can change to better align yourself. Can you think of a process you can, something you can change to better align yourself? Say amen if you can think of something. I, I didn't really hear most of you. Okay. So you know what that is. So because we also know how we are and how we know that sometimes we'll revert to habitual patterns and we'll forget. I want you to pray one for another that you can be strengthened, that you won't just throw it off in a few days, but that it will have such an effect on you that there's a literal exercise. Is this all right, Bishop? Yep, that there's an exercise, because here's what I notice that happens a lot. Because the greatest effect of a message is not what you do at this altar. The greatest effect of a message is what you do at your next altar. And so what I noticed a lot, even in conferences, men go to conferences and then people don't change anything. And it's, it's kind of frustrating in one relationship. It's like, okay, how much great preaching can we hear? Not that this was great, but how much great preaching can we hear until we are not doing it? We become actually addicts of good sermons and addicts of, of good moves of God. And then we don't put something into motion. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, I've done it. Okay, maybe you've never done it, but I've done it before. Have you done it? Yeah, of course you have. And we hear this stuff and it moves us to the moment, but it doesn't move us to another pattern. So what I'm talking about here requires an adjustment, a readjustment, if you will. It's the chiropractic 
dimension of God, I guess, where God is realigning us because if the alignment happens, stuff will start to happen among us like we've not seen before. I am positive of that because either, either that's the case or this book is a lie. And sis, I don't think this book is a lie. This book's not a lie. This book's the truth, okay? And, and there's a deliverance coming to you. You hear me? There's a deliverance coming to you. You listen to what I'm telling you. God is going to lose a dimension of peace over you. This big blanket of peace that wants to wrap itself around your heart because your heart looks inflamed and a swelling heart is a sign of some things that have pressured you and gone wrong. So God's going to wrap his peace around you, okay? So I want you to put some things in your mind into action. I want you right now to lay your hands one upon the other and ask Ask the Lord to give your brother or your sister strength. And God is going to give them strength by reiterating, bringing it back to their mind. So when they get to their next altar and their next altar and their next altar and their next altar, there's something that rises up in their spirit that causes an alignment. Amen. By the casting off of a personal will. And by the God, I praise you here tonight for your word that has been spoken in this house. But Lord, even greater than the moment's word and Lord revelation that you have given us tonight, I pray that an action be tied to the revelation and the action with the revelation causes an alignment like never before. The dominion, oh God, could have its rightful attachment as we step into our rightful place by the action of a selfless vessel that puts himself at the altar that a dying flesh generation could cause a loosing of a resurrection and a revelation Lord God that will cause the earth to feel the impact and cause the spirit world to feel the aggression and cause the angels to be triggered and cause your voice to hear be heard on the earth and cause your revelation God almighty to come forth in the hearts of men that they could come falling in the presence of your dominion and power and anointing and glory and grace and mercy and truth by reason of the action of the church in alignment. That's it, pray for them. That's it, pray for strength. That's it, pray for reoccurring memory banks to remember the word of the Lord. Not just this word, but the words that have been spoken to you as of late in the last several months. Oh God, that we could die out in the process of the selfish Lord arena of our society and cause the divine operation of your holy kingdom and spirit to be God accessible on a perpetual basis that the eye oh God is singly attached to your visual perception that the heart is singly attached to your heartbeat that the soul is singly attached to your Holy Ghost that our habits are singly attached to our devotion and that our relationship is singly attached to your love by the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name Jesus, by the anointing that is upon us as children of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So be it upon the people of God. Why don't you lift your hands and let God impart to you all over this building. Why don't you lift your hands and lift your voice and let God impart and streamline into your spirit 
seed beds of gifts and callings, impartations, and moments, memorials that will transpire because of the action of the earth. Let there be a reaction come out of heaven until it saturates every soul saint and vessel and household of faith that the Lord and that which he has desired to produce and replicate and multiply may come upon the children of light by reason of the timing upon us in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to pray Ephesians chapter 6 prayer that Paul described to the church. He said, Won't you pray for me? He didn't ask to pray for more power. He said, What I actually need is boldness. I want you to pray, lay your hands back on somebody and ask the Lord, tell them after they have aligned themselves, oh God, after they have done what is upon their heart and committed to do what is upon their spirit, after the alignment takes place, Lord, I pray now, Lord, make them an ambassador. God, cause them to speak boldly as they ought to speak. Cause them, Lord, to become a faithful minister of the Lord in the workplace, in the house, in the marketplace. Cause their purpose, O oh God, almighty Savior, to be so streamlined that the effect and cause of your power and your spirit may now begin to multiply. Cause a word to become like ten. And Lord, then cause a word to become like a hundred. Lord, then cause a word to become like five hundred. Then cause a word as they grow in this dimension to become like a thousand. Lord, until one can put a thousand to flight. Lord, and two can put ten thousand to flight. Let the multiplication by reason of alignment cause the dominion to begin to magnify and multiply what is upon this vessel. The Bible says to rejoice, but he said, I don't want you to rejoice because you have spiritual authority. He said, don't rejoice because the devils are subject unto you. So let's give a reason why to rejoice. He said, rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Over that we do have the right to rejoice. So why don't you lift your voice and why don't you rejoice by the blood of the Lamb that taketh away the sins of all world. Rejoice that your name because of your baptism in Jesus' name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for your resolve. Thank you for your 
kindness. Thank you for your glory. Jesus name. That's all right, somebody just lift your voice and give praise unto the Lord in this place. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you that you wrote our name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good to us. We deserve it. Not at all. But we are grateful more than all. In Jesus' name. If, there, if you're not baptized in Jesus' name, let me command you while the Spirit is upon us. You can command spiritual people. You have to teach carnal people. Peter commanded them in Acts 10 because they had just gotten the Holy Ghost. And they obeyed. The reason we have to teach so many Bible studies is because people are carnal. They don't know how to acquiesce to the Spirit. But if you're not baptized in Jesus' name... I ask you in the name of Jesus and command you under the Spirit of God to be baptized in Jesus' name. Not Father, Son, Holy Ghost, not Buddha, Krishna. No, in Jesus' name. And if you have not done it in the name of Jesus, don't consider it. Obey it. It's not an issue of thinking about it. It's an issue of obeying the Word. So be subject to the Word and do that. So if you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, and you will be, raise your hand if you've not been. I don't know that there's anyone, but I'm asking because I just want to ask in honor of your filled up tank. Praise the Lord. And because I feel it of the Lord to ask. So, And if you've not received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, we want to pray with you. You're going to get it. And uh, so come up here if you've not received the Holy Ghost. If, if there's someone like that here, there may not be. But it's all right. Why don't we lift our hands and thank the Lord for what God has moved some chess pieces in this place here tonight. It's the way I feel, like something has moved on the board. And lift your hands if you can, and let's just give God a praise. Would you do it? Would you do it? Would you do it all over this building? Would you do it? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. Jesus. Mm. You know, People, people, people take, and there's nothing wrong with vitamins and all that. It's, it's fine. We're trying to help our, our physical bodies to stay in line, really, to health. But I, I, w I want to ask you to do something. Lay, lay your hand on somebody that's close to you and pray. I want you to pray health into their navel and that every cell the over 100 million cells that make up the body, that every cell receive a refreshing and that every cell receive a rejuvenation in their physical body. Would you lay your hand on somebody right now? God, I pray for the cell base of my brother's body. God, bring health to his navel, as the word says. Lord, from that very cord all the way through his body, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you, Lord, for over a hundred million cells. Lord, Roko Rika San. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship him. Let's thank him for what he's done. God, we worship you. We praise you. We glorify you. We exalt you for what you have accomplished, God. Thank you for the work of your spirit right now, God. Uh, thank you for the power that works in us. Uh, thank you for your anointing, Lord. Thank you for your healing. Uh, thank you for your refreshing here right now. Uh, I love you, Jesus. I give it all to you. I rest in you completely. Thank you for your healing, God. Thank you for the power of your spirit, God. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing the cries and attending to the prayer, Jesus. Thank 